Welcome to Eventful Endeavors, secrets to crafting the perfect celebration. If you're planning an event and looking for useful tips from industry experts, you're in the right place. So get ready to take some notes and we'll dive right in. This is Eventful Endeavors. All right, welcome back to another episode of Eventful Endeavors. We are here today with Rebecca Grant, who is a wedding planner and venue manager up in Snohomish in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And I'm also a venue owner, just a manager. <laughs> venue owner. Yeah, venue yes, owner. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're going to get into that in a little bit. But the first thing I like to ask everybody um, is kind of how you got started in the wedding industry. You know, what's your kind of story? Where did you come from? How did you get into this this world? Yeah, my background, uh, quite a few years ago, I'm 20 years in as a wedding planner at this point, but it started back in around 2003. Um, I was looking for a career change at that point and really had a very strong interest in hospitality and business ownership. And so in talking with several people, this was right at the beginning of when wedding planning was actually a career. And so I started talking with quite a few different people and they're like, I think pl wedding planning might be your, your gig, your thing. And so I looked into it. Uh, and at the time, it was either Hawaii, New York, or Florida within the U.S. that offered actual degrees in hospitality and wedding planning. And so I uh, was able to up and move to Hawaii at that time and ended up nice. finding a place to stay and enrolled in the University of Hawaii uh, Travel Industry Management Program and lived on the island for about four and a half years. Well, that's exciting. And then how long have you lived up in the Pacific Northwest? When did you go up there? Are you originally from there? Or was that just a decision you made later? Yeah, that was just a decision to go to school there. So I grew up here in the okay. Pacific Northwest, moved to Hawaii to go to school for wedding planning. Uh, life cir circumstances changed, moved back home, and then I uh, la launched my business here in Seattle. So it was good to be able to move back home. Um, I had to reestablish myself, of course, because on the islands, I was working for an established wedding planner already. So I kind of was right. built in with, with her gigs, of course. And um, as I was coming back to Seattle, you know, I knew I knew what I was doing, but nobody else knew what I was doing. And uh, yeah. just kind of was able to get my foot in the door very, very uniquely. Um, I specialize in Asian and Pacific Islander weddings because of my time in Hawaii. And sure. so because of that, when I moved back home at the time, there was no planners that specialized in APPI weddings. And so I really could get my foot in the door of saying like, I know customs, I know cultures. Yes, I know I'm as white as the snow, but I, I got it. You know, <laughs> like I can handle yeah. all these different Asian uh, customs and cultures that are thrown my way. So you were doing a lot of that at first. Have you expanded since then? Now you do kind of a little bit of everything. And do you still do a lot of those, those cultural weddings? Not as many as when I first started uh, by any means, but um, I, it is still a good percentage of my weddings that I'm doing. It's about 30%, um, either full Asian or mixed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do anything, but uh, that still definitely has a piece of my heart for sure, just because that's how I got my experience and my foot in the door here in sure. Seattle. Yeah. So uh, here's a question I like to ask is, you know, if you, you know, coming from wedding planning and whatnot, so when you talk to newlyweds, newly engaged couples, you know, what's kind of the first piece of advice you kind of give people when they're just getting started? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few different key pieces. Number one, you're always going to hear every wedding planner say is budget. Be very, very realistic right. with what you can afford. And it's fine if it's not a six figure wedding. Not everybody can afford that and you can still have a lovely yeah. wedding for 20 grand, but I might just not be your planner. Um, so it's, it's really making sure number two is that we are a good fit mutually for each other. So not only are they coming with a realistic expectation of budget, but also knowing that I will work well with them and that they are going to be a good fit for me. You know, I'm working with these couples for a year to a year and a half. And right. that level of trust is imperative. If you don't trust me, don't hire me. And if you feel like I can't be with you, you know, with your aunties and uncles and grandparents and with your wedding party all day on start to finish, I'm not going to be the best fit for you. Um, sure. But I do, I do, do tell my couples from the initial consultation, what I need from you is timely responses. I literally cannot do my job unless I get a response from my couples. It really stalls the process moving forward. 
and it makes for a much more stressful planning experience. So the faster that those items can be crossed off the to-do list, I will guide you through. I'll guide you through what's next and get you through it. Yeah. And yes, it'll be a lot of decisions, but you won't have nearly the amount of stress that your girlfriend, you know, who just got engaged is like, oh my gosh, I cannot, I don't know where to start and what to do on my own. Yeah. And I've talked a lot of, to a lot of people about budget. Do you usually come in like process wise? Do you find mm -hmm. yourself where couples already kind of have a budget or do you build it for them? Or do you have couples that already built their budget and you say, okay, this isn't going to work with what you want? Like, yeah. you know, how does that, where do you usually come yeah. in, in the process? 90% of the time couples will hire me with a date and a venue already booked. So I'm kind of either sure. second on the totem pole. Sometimes they even have a photographer booked. So sometimes I'm second or third. So it is great when I'm at the top of the totem pole and I'm like, yes, yeah. I can build a totally real realistic budget for you. But if they have come in with date and venue already set, then I go over their vendor needs with them. So I literally go through an entire list of, do you want or need a hair and makeup artist, a photographer, a florist, um, live musicians, you know, what does that look like to you? What does your wedding day look like to you? Cause it's different sure. for everybody. And then from there, I put together a budget spreadsheet that is based off of their wants and desires and also on their guest count. And I put together a realistic budget for them within their venue setting of what they can expect to spend for their wedding day. So some people, you know, are super heavily reliant on flowers and decor. So I'm going to bump that guy up a little bit more than I would for somebody who's like, I want the best killer photographer in the world. Get me that best person, you know, so it's going to be different for each person. Right. I love that you said that because I've talked to a few people about this where I think some couples have this weird idea that if they hire a wedding planner that they don't get any con creative control over their wedding which I love that you said you kind of give them like, what are your dreams? What do you want? Yep. I'm going to make that come true within this realistic budget. Because I've totally. I found that a lot. Like some people are like, that's not how it works though, right? Like, I mean, you, the couple is still in control of their destiny, I guess. And you just kind of help facilitate it, right? Yeah, absolutely. In my 20 years, over 500, probably pushing almost 600 weddings at this point, I've no joke had two couples that have said, here's my credit card. You design it and you do everything. That's wow. just not the reality, Did you, like that? you know? <laughs> no, I didn't actually because no. I didn't know. <laughs> You're like, I don't like what, this. No, and I didn't know yeah. what flowers they were allergic to. And I didn't know what right. spices they liked on their meat, you know? So I still had to figure out some mm. decisions here and there. I'm like, I'm not comfortable creating your entire menu for you because that's very, very personal. Um, but the ones, you know... So the majority of my couples, yes, I'm going to get to know what their wishes are, what their top priorities are, and plan accordingly. You know, so that starts, of sure. course, with the initial plan of the budget, but then it also moves into design and then it moves into vendor curation at that point as well. So all of those things should work in tandem with each other. And I give my couples ultimate veto power on if you don't want to work with that vendor, no problem. So especially my full planning clients. Um, it's very much of a collaboration on, okay, here's the top three that I think are going to be an excellent fit for you. And then I give them three options. Option one, you love this person right out of the gate. You followed them on Instagram forever. You are totally down for hiring that person. No questions asked. Option two is you can't decide between A and B. Can we set up a consultation with both? Great. Let's see who you drive with and see who you click with. Option three is I hate everyone start over. And that's totally fine. Like you're not going to hurt my feelings, but I also have been doing this long enough that very rarely do I get to that option three. But um, right. it's, it's just, I always want couples to know that they are in the driver's seat, that they have ultimate veto power and decisions being made. That's good. I like that. And I, I it kind of goes along though. What's one of the biggest like mistakes you see couples make like early or something that they usually think is going to work. And then like, you're like, no, this is not something that you should do. Like, is there anything <laughs> that springs to mind as like a big mistake that like, hmm. just putting it out there, like couples should maybe avoid thinking about doing this or doing this or. Yeah. I know it's a very big East coast thing, but doing toasts between courses of meals, are, I am not a fan. I just, I, mm. the timing gets completely thrown off. You know, if you're trying to cater 150 person event and keep food warm and on time breaking right. that up with somebody who could potentially go rogue on a toast that goes oh i know they told me i only had three minutes but i'm gonna take 15 well that sets back 
all of your service and your meal and everything. And so on the surface to a guest, it might be okay, but internally on the planner side and on the venue side and on the caterer side, everyone's freaking out. And then I'm also thinking timeline wise, I only have my photographer and videographer until, you know, 10 PM, let's say, right. So if, Mm -hmm. if the guest decides to mix things up and go a little bit off schedule, we are potentially losing couples coverage or costing them more money because that that person has decided right. to go over. So I do like to group the toasts all together. Um, just keep it short, sweet, simple, four toasters max. Um, never open it up to somebody else unless the couples feel <sighs> extremely strong about it. But I'm not a, a big proponent on that. Um, but yeah, I just like to kind of keep keep things rolling and keep things concise. Yeah. And speaking of like long toasts and whatnot, uh, what's the, I guess, what's like the cringiest thing you've seen in a wedding or something that happened that springs to mind where you're like, oh, that was so uncomfortable. It could be a speech. It could be a a dance gone wrong. It could be anything. Like what's something you saw where you were just like, oh no. The number one that comes to mind is the father, or excuse me, the mother son dance at one of the weddings I did very early on in my career. The mother and son had choreographed a dance, but the bride and groom had not choreographed a dance. So it was like very okay. just rock, rock, rock for the bride and, and groom. And then all of a sudden mom comes onto the scene and it's like this <laughs> full on choreographed number and no joke. They even did a lift and he was like parading oh her God. around the dance floor. And I'm like, this is so weird. Why in the world would you yeah, prioritize why? your mother over your bride? And I'm like, oh, it was just, it was weird. It was a very cringe. That's kind of strange. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It was that is strange. definitely kind of strange. Yeah. It's, oh, and it yeah, I don't. Still I don't. sticks out this many years later. I mean, that had to have been, gosh, pretty much right after I moved back from Hawaii. So it was either 2009 or 2010. And it still sticks out as a right. moment of like, <laughs> Why did you do Interesting that? choice. Put a lot of yes. work into that dance. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yes. definitely a little little strange. Uh, I mean, yeah. similar to that, though, what about on the on the flip side of that? Is there anything that st- sticks out to you as like the most unique thing you've ever seen or your favorite? I mean, you can just say your favorite wedding or favorite thing you ever saw, like um, yeah. that ring, anything things, ring a bell? Things that stick out for sure are my multi- multicultural weddings that I get to do. Um, sure. You know, because I, I did not get exposed to that growing up. Right. And so being able to attend and plan these weddings where it was like, you know, we're bringing in this culture and this culture and this culture. And I'll never, ever, ever forget a wedding at the Seattle Aquarium. So it had this beautiful blue aqua background and there was the dance floor directly in front of that uh, big aquarium. And it was an Indian and a Jewish wedding combined. And so everyone okay. was encouraged to wear like, you know, Indian garb. And so the the ladies were wearing saris and the gentlemen were wearing tunics and it was just so bright and colorful and they were dancing the Hora. Like it was just, it was so cool. You know, I was up on yeah. the upper patio level um, at the aquarium and just looking down and seeing like all this color and all these amazing, yeah. like blending of customs and cultures coming together in one really, really cool moment. I think that's really cool. And I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about that because I don't talk to too many people about like other cultural weddings. Like that's something that mm-hmm. we haven't really talked to many people about. So uh, let's talk about it a little bit. Are these, so sure. I've done a few, like the most I've done is maybe like a couple, I did a couple Vietnamese weddings and they were mm-hmm. really fun. A lot of people. Um, are a lot of these weddings that you're doing for these other cultures, are they big weddings? Like I know a lot of, uh, especially Asian cultures tend to have very, mm-hmm. very large weddings, like 400 plus people. Like, do you find that that's like a thing? Uh, leaning into the Indian side, yes, but more of the weddings that yeah. I specialize in of the Southeast Asian, of Chinese, Japan, Japanese, Filipino, um, Hawaiian, Samoan, Vietnamese, Thai, Korean, those tend to be much more on the more manageable, smaller side. So I would say like okay. 200 or under tends to be pretty average for those. But once you get into the okay. Indian side, which is not my specialty, I've done a handful of them, but definitely not my, my go-to um, they, they can get yeah. quite large anywhere between 400 to 600 people. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, the one wedding, I mean, the Vietnamese couple, they were amazing. They were so much fun, but I was like, I was talking to the groom. I was like, how many of these people do you know? And he's like, maybe 20. It's like, yeah. He's yeah. like, I don't totally. even know how these people, 
Yes. I was like, that's so crazy. He's like, I'm pretty sure that guy just like works at the deli. My dad yeah. goes to. I'm like, <laughs> yes. no. Well, and it's very, it was very amazing. cultural, like, you know, crazy. like families yeah, want yeah. to invite families, want to invite families, want to invite families. And so it, it right. gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I would say probably my Filipino weddings out of all the cultures I yeah. specialize in tend to be the largest. And so those can right. get quite, uh, quite high in numbers for sure. What are some of like the biggest differences? Like obviously, like, you know, doing weddings in the States, so we do a lot of Jewish weddings. So we know like the horror, mm-hmm. like what are some of the big, like, things that happen in those weddings that, um, you know, we don't do over here, like culturally, either at the ceremony or the reception, like, is there anything that you're like, Oh, they do this. And it's really, really fun or really exciting. Yeah. So we've had, um, you know, top two of out of those cultures are, well, Filipino, I would say top three, actually, Chinese, Filipino, and Japanese. Um, And so you have to be very aware of color palettes. So Chinese weddings tend to Hmm. lean more into the golds, reds, burgundies, um, they do not use white because that's a, a color of, of death actually in China. And so mm. um, it will be as, as couples get more and more westernized, uh, that that tradition is going away more and more. So you will tr- sometimes does the bride, see a bride. Does the bride wear white? I'm that's sorry to interrupt. Does say. the bride wear yeah. white? No, the bride. Okay. Yeah. So as they get more and more westernized, the bride will wear white. However, quite okay. often she'll change into a red tea ceremony dress, right? So you're still giving a nod to that culture, but it's not as all in as if you were to, to have a full Chinese wedding. Gotcha. Um, certainly Chinese lion dancers I brought in, um, having eight courses, because eight is an auspicious number in Chinese culture. Uh, and then you switch to Japanese culture where white is a sign of purity. And it's you know something that is very much used within those right. weddings. Um, I brought in uh, Japanese taiko drummers before, which was amazing. Um, and then certainly with the Japanese food, I'm a big fan. So I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, Filipino weddings are just fun. They're amazing. Like I, right. I often say if I believed in reincarnation, I would want to be reincarnated as a Filipino. I love them. Their families are incredible. I've never met right. a pretentious or snobby or rude Filipino person. They are just so great. And of course their food is amazing as well. But then with that, yeah. their ceremony is very different. So they tend to go into the Catholic church quite often. And uh, mm. they'll wear, gentlemen will wear a traditional barong, which is made of pineapple fiber. So it's a really lightweight um, shirt and it has a design through it so they can get quite elaborate. Uh, and then they will also incorporate sponsors. So people that have helped pay for the wedding, quite often these are aunts, uncles, godparents. Um, and there'll be a sponsor of coins, veil, cord, Bible, uh, and they will actually walk down the aisle with them. So my Filipino processionals are the longest cool. processional of any culture. Um, I, quite often, they can get up to about 40 people. Well, I feel like, you know, with a lot of those, because like, I know a lot of the, you know, those cultures do have like many courses for their food and whatnot. I feel like when you go from one of those to then coming to the Western weddings, these got to be easy comparatively. Yes, I feel like they got to be easy, really like a uh, little buffet and then let's dance. Right. I mean, yep, exactly. Compared exactly. to that. Yeah. 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 You're like, this food is, is a way very, easier very to do these kind of things. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Pretty basic over here in the States, you know, yep. keeping it simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so let's change it a little bit. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the venue. So you bought sure. a venue, you own this venue. So what, what happened? Like what, what, what inspired this and talk to me about the venue. Yeah. So pretty much ever since I started off as a wedding planner, I knew venue ownership was going to be, be my what's next, right? That was always my next step. Okay. So, um, met my husband, got married in 2010 and carried on through wedding planning, da, da, da. And he knew that owning a venue was, was always my what's next. And so he got kind of drug along for the ride. He's in IT, so this was not his stick at all. Um, but with that, we actively started looking for properties in 2017. And so we looked everywhere from the Skagit Valley all the way down to Tacoma and everywhere in between. And so with that, um, we, you know, I started posting on Instagram, you know, just going Instagram live saying, Hey, I'm out at this property in Granite Falls today. Um, what do you guys think about this property? This is where I think I would do the ceremony. This is about how many people I think it could hold, blah, blah, blah. Right. So as I started doing that, um, fast forward to 2019 and, um, we, I was actually working a wedding and my phone started blowing up, blowing up. 
and people were like, oh my gosh, Twin Willow Gardens just came up for sale. You have to buy this venue. Oh my gosh. Oh, you yeah. know, so yeah. I, um, the, the really crazy miracle, ironic, however you want to phrase it part was that my assistant for that day was the daughter-in-law of the second owners of this property. And so she Whoa. was, text- I know she was texting the current owners who are looking to sell and saying, you know, what are you asking? Um, what are you looking for in a buyer? All the stuff. Cause they didn't put it on MLS. It was just a private word of mouth for sale. And so she was giving this information to me in real time of like, this is how much they're asking. Yeah. This is what they're looking for. You know? So I was like, okay. So that was on a Friday. And then um, fast forward to Sunday, we had a setup uh, meeting with the current owners of the property and uh, we officially made an offer Tuesday morning. So it all wow. happened very quickly. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. And then the even more amazing part was because of my planning career, I had already done weddings at this property. I had already been to this home that I'm sitting in because of uh, the second owner's daughter-in-law. Um, I And then when we hosted our friends and family open house, um, we invited our neighbors because, of course, we wanted to get to know them. And she is my primary care physician, and he went to the same college as my husband. So, I mean, we totally hit it off with them. And so it just, it very, very much was meant to be. The downside yeah. was the following year was COVID. So it was not was a super ask. awesome yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a very, very tough first couple of years to get through, for sure. Sure. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you had this new spot, and you, I mean, you couldn't really do any weddings. I mean... Is it mostly, is it an outdoor venue or is it a little bit combination of both kind of thing? Yeah, we're fully outdoor. We do have one okay. small outbuilding, but it just houses the restrooms and there is a little bit of space in there. A lot of, a lot of couples will do like photo booth, um, ice cream sure. bar, espresso bar, you know, kind of in that little outbuilding, but it's certainly not large enough to accommodate indoor spacing, but we do provide yeah. our tents. Mm-hmm. So now that we're kind of on the, you know, other side of this thing, uh, how's it mm-hmm. going? I mean, are you guys uh, loving it? Or are you having a great time doing it? You love, I mean, you've always wanted to do it. So how are you feeling yeah. about it? Yeah, I'm feeling actually really good. Uh, we recovered good. very nicely. We're fully booked for this year. We're about 50% booked for next awesome. year. Awesome. And um, yeah, so it's it's a really good position to be in. And other things that I really learned about the venue ownership side, um, I could not do this without my husband. And that was a big wake up call to me of like, wow, you know, I'm really good at the sales side and of the knowing how to market a venue and what updates to make in order to make it more appealing to to couples. However, the maintenance side was really, really eye opening to me of just Mm -hmm. all the tiny little things that he does throughout the week are pretty incredible. And if I was just on my own having to pay for all of that for a a handyman to come in and do your overhead would be even more than it already is with the venue. So that that was very much an eye opener to me. And I'm really thankful that he is quite handy. So (laughs) he's able to get all that stuff done. Yeah. Good. It's, you got a handy husband who's fixing all the stuff. I love it. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's and great though. So do you, yeah. do you still plan at the same time? Do you only plan weddings at this venue now? I mean, what's this combination world look like now? Yeah. So that was actually one of my biggest fears in taking over the venue was people thinking that I'm done planning. I'm not done planning. That's actually my cool. primary source of income is still. Planning. Okay. So I do about 20 to 25 weddings um, off site every year. And so I tend to get booked uh, because 20 years in, I am at a higher price point than a lot of other planners. And so I tend to be booked at the the venues that kind of command six-figure weddings. And so I do work a lot in Seattle, a lot in Woodenville. There are a handful of couples that will hire me to plan their wedding here at my venue. And that's not very many, though. Out of the 47 weddings, I'm doing two this year. So it's they're not required to use me by any means. They right. are required to have a planner, but it does not have to be me. And they are required, if they are interested in using me, to actually do a formal interview. It's not, hey, I'm giving you a tour. Oh, can we hire you as a planner? You don't know anything about my planning services. Right. So it, it does have yeah. to go through that formal process. Um, so I am I am still actively a wedding planner. Uh, still actively own the venue. And then my husband still actively has a full-time night, Monday through Friday night to find job. So we stay nice. very, very busy between the two of us. Yeah. 
That's exciting though. You, I mean, yes, I mean, it if it's what you've wanted and it's, it works out, that's great. And you know, I like that too. So I was going to ask you how many weddings you kind of manage uh, per year. So 25 is kind of your rates, you know, which is what on average is like two a month or something like that. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if, if they perfectly fell January through December, I'm amazing, but that never happens. Of course, yeah, so. of course <laughs> there are half of them are in September. It's like, Oh no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So my, my season right now at 21 weddings is mid May through the last week of September. And then I have okay. a bit of a gap until November and I have one in November. Most so. of them are in, they're all in that May. Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, all in that time frame. Yeah. That's the busy season up there. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And uh, of course that's when the venue is rocking and rolling too. Since we are an outdoor venue, we operate mid May through the last weekend of September. So it's, right. it's all systems go when that hits. Great. So since you're on, I imagine you're, you know, if you're out planning a wedding on a Saturday somewhere else or on site for that wedding at the venue, do you have like an in-house manager that just kind of handles everything there? We do. Yeah. So in the morning we have high school gals that help us with setting up tables, chairs, doing a general once through of cleanup, and then also making sure that the tiny homes where we have couples get ready in, um, that those are cleaned, stocked, ready to go for the day. And then they stay through the start of the ceremony, and then it transitions to our afternoon to evening person, um, who is a little bit older. She's more our age, um, and she operates just kind of keeping an eye on everything and making sure you know that the bathrooms are stocked. And right. uh, you know, at the end of the night, if the if the getaway car comes up, she takes down the the rope, you know, to let them onto the property. So little things like that. Um, she's not there to monitor or watch anybody like a hawk. It's just there to be an, a person in case something goes wrong with the venue. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, we're about at time here, but before we leave, I do want to ask uh, this. I want to go completely out of the blue and off topic. So talk to me about these animals you have uh chickens bats bees what's what's going on you got like a a whole farm up there what do you what's what's the story we've got a little menagerie we're out on six acres up here in snohomish and um we do have 10 chickens uh that lay eggs for us so we do sell our eggs um and then we've got two two golden retriever dogs um so with that we do try and keep our property as natural as possible because we are eating the eggs that our chickens produce right so uh, down at the venue, we have two bat boxes, and so that takes nice. care of natural mosquito repellent. And so we don't have to spray or chemicalize our property as much as some of the other venues that choose to go that yep. route. And no, no issue, but that's just what we've chosen to da- to do. And then um, we also have mason bee houses. So those that are not familiar with mason bees, they're actually more beneficial than honey bees. They just don't produce. Uh, so they are actually better pollinators than honeybees are, and they're solitary bees. So they actually put themselves in little cocoons. And then come this time of year, we take their cocoons out of our refrigerator where they've been stored all winter, and we let them go. So they chew themselves out of their cocoons, and then off they go and wow. they pollinate all of the orchards and the fields nearby. Yeah, so that's, that's a fun little hobby. I like that. Yeah, yeah, and it. I mean, our we're we are a garden venue and so it's incredibly beneficial for our flower beds and just cross pollinating our neighbors have a little mini orchard with fruit trees and they said that the first year we moved in was the best harvest they've ever had so look into that's great it's easy hobby they're fun to do but yeah between our bats and our mason bees and then our house has solar panels so (laughs) we try try and keep it pretty natural out here (laughs) yeah my my wife would love this conversation because she's been telling me she's like I want to get a bat hotel and I want to get a a, a a bee yeah she wants to do all that yes. in our yes in our place too and I was like I don't know if I want bats and she's like but you hate the mosquitoes I was like I do hate the yep. mosquitoes so yeah. I was like no yeah, joke maybe we'll I was do it. sitting out in my hot tub one night and I'm like there's a mosquito where's the bat and no sooner did I you say saw that, it? a bat swooped in and was like I got you <laughs> it was so cool. that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's great. We, that's great. We use bat B and B for our bat boxes, and then we do um, sell back and harvest our bees through Crown Bees out of Woodenville. If anyone's looking for resources, great, um, awesome. Well, listen, I, I that's pretty much it for me. I mean, we'll obviously link to all your socials and all that stuff for the venue and for your wedding planning and all the fun stuff that we can do um, once this gets uh, put out there. But uh, in, in the meantime, is there anything else you kind of want to? mention anything else we missed anything else that you're really passionate about or 
Uh, anything? Any fun anecdote? I don't know. Anything before we uh, call it quits? Um, my saving grace is I still keep my hobbies outside of being really busy. So anytime anybody wants yeah. to talk to me about ice skating or gardening or dogs, I am your gal. So come find me. Ice skating. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Uh, for, uh, ice skating is a big thing. You're a big ice skater. Uh, Thanks. well, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for, uh, um, you know, hanging out with us, talking to us today. I appreciate it. Um, we'll link to all your stuff so people know where to find you and best of luck in all your endeavors and congratulations on owning the venue. Uh, that's awesome. So thank you. You have a great rest of your day. All right. You as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of eventful endeavors, secrets to crafting the perfect celebration. We hope to have left you with some actionable ideas for your own event. If you like the show, please subscribe and definitely leave us a review. We read every comment. So until next time, happy planning and see you soon on Eventful Endeavors.